Live from Gloucester, this is The Saturday Breakfast Show with Darren Lester, and you are listening live. Hey, very good morning to you on this Saturday, the 4th of March, 2023. We are answering the question, why bother teaching? With all of the negative press that our profession gets, why should anybody go into it to begin with? This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you are listening live. Tune in live at ttradio.org or join in the conversation by downloading the Podbean app and following Teachers Talk Radio. Hashtag TT Radio. Good morning to you all. I am glad that you could this join me for This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational. It is, but I didn't mean to tell you that just yet. <laughs> Good morning. We'll try that again. I am glad that you are all here to join us for breakfast this morning. Um, it has been quite an exciting week, let's be honest. Um, in the Teachers Talk Radio Slack, Tom, at uh, at the beginning of the month, posted a list of all of the different days and dates that uh, that we might want to build shows around. And I find it fascinating that this week in particular is just full of loads of them. We've had so much stuff going on this week. It has been a really exciting time to be in the classroom. Of course, as long-term listeners of the show will know, here at Saturday Breakfast, we are big fans of literature. And so World Book Day, of course, was my favourite of the things that we have had this week. Um, And I thought, to start with, I would indulge my inner booktuber. I do think I secretly want to become a book influencer. Um, I've decided I watch like unboxings and things of you know, that people get sent from publishers all the time. And I'm just like, I want that. So if any publishers are listening and they would like to send me some free books to talk about uh, on Saturday Breakfast, I'm, I'm not quite sure how ethical that would be and I would need to run it past my bosses here. But uh, I would be open for it personally. But what I thought I would do is just have a look at the books that I have read so far in 2023 and um, just talk about the ones that I have most enjoyed. And then when we've done that, we will have a listen to the news and then we will get into the meat of our topic today, which is why should we teach? What is the point with everything that, that we go through, with all the negativity that we hear? Why why bother? Why bother? Okay, books. I have called up my tracker. Um, I've decided to go high tech this year. And by high tech, I mean I've got a spreadsheet. Um, usually I do like to keep track of the books that I read only because, um, I'm quite a competitive person with myself and I do like to see if I can beat my, um, beat my own personal bests. Uh, last year I did this in my paper planner, um, and I ended up just keeping pages and pages of notes on all of the books that I read. Um, so this year I've decided to take it over to a spreadsheet, which is quite cool, um, because it can generate graphs and stuff for me, which makes it easier to read. So far in 2023, I have read 26 books, um, which is not too bad. Uh, I have not finished one of them. And the reason for that was that the uh, electronic loan from the library expired and I didn't realise. And I figured that if I didn't realise that it disappeared from the library, then I probably didn't care too much about it to begin with. Um, I've read a total of 3,134 pages, and I have listened to nine hours of audiobook. Uh, My biggest reading month so far has been February, where I read 1,630 pages. Uh, January, I read 1,200 pages, and so far in March, I've read 304. So I am doing all right. February was a bit of a slow start for me. I'm going to be honest. I didn't think I would. Uh, I didn't think I would match January. So I was quite happy to have surpassed that. I've been really lucky, actually, with my books so far. Um, be 
because aside obviously from the one that I didn't finish, I have enjoyed all of them. Uh, my lowest rating has been a 2.5 um, out of 5. And that was for a the first issue of a comic book that I tried back in January. Um, it sounded like it was my sort of thing. It was about witches and it was about cyborgs and um, all that cool stuff. But I ended up kind of not enjoying it at all. So I decided that I wouldn't carry on with that series. So that has been a, like I said, a 2.5 out of 5 or a 2 star rating. Um, my... Favourite books are totaling 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. I have 10 five-star reads. So 10 five out of five reads so far, which I am very pleased about. Um, I think of all of those, my favourites so far this year have been Atlas 6 by um, Olivia Blake. Atlas 6 is a... Dark Academia fantasy book. There is a series, I think it's a trilogy, um, about a group of teens who are, um, I can't remember what the word they use, but they're essentially witches, wizards, and they are recruited by this kind of shady, shadowy society to protect the Library of Alexandria which didn't disappear at all, but is in fact under the protection of this uh, this society of witches. And the the whole of the first book is us getting to know the the characters, the six the six teenagers who are chosen to be part of this society, the the eponymous Atlas Six. And ultimately one of them has to be eliminated from the group because there can only be five people to protect the library. So the first book is all about that, that elimination and the events leading up to it. It was it was really enjoyable. I can't say that I like any of the characters. Uh, and usually, of course, when you don't like any of the main characters, it's hard to get into a book. But actually, for me, it was their unlikability that I found compelling. Because all of them were quite shady themselves, which I suppose is why they were drawn into this shady society to begin with. And it's kind of all about how self-serving they are in under the guise of helping other people. And I quite like that as, a, as an exploration of human nature. You know, what does it mean to be selfless when you are somebody who is actually selfish by nature? So I really enjoyed that one. Um, if you are into kind of young adult, new adult fantasy, uh, I highly recommend that one. Um, I have enjoyed lots of comic books. We know that uh, the comic books are my thing. Radiant Pink by Megan Camarena is a good one. I like superheroes. I am a big superhero nerd, have been forever. Uh, and so the whole Radiant series, actually, I quite enjoy, published by Boom Studios. Uh, but Radiant Pink is really good. The, the idea is the super heroine in this one is a streamer. Um, Megan herself is a streamer, so it is kind of based on her own experiences. And it's about how she juggles, how the, the, the main character juggles being a streamer and a superhero. And I quite like that. I quite like that because, you know, streaming is not going anywhere influencers are not going anywhere there have always been personalities you know as i said um on the show a couple of weeks ago it is much easier these days to become a personality you know i'm here talking to you via podbean um i don't need to have been approached by radio one to be on the radio i can have been approached by tom as i was and i can come to you every saturday morning and so where it is now very very easy to create your own platform you don't even need to create a specific account with youtube anybody who's got a google account already has a youtube channel ready to go so you know this industry isn't going anywhere and i think it's good when it's explored in in fiction when it's explored in media because we all know that the tides are changing and where 
even just 10 years ago, if you would ask most kids, what do you want to be when you are older? You'd have had the replies of um, footballer, actress, writer, you know, all of those kind of big dreams. But now the, the, the primary focus is, I would like to be a streamer. And who wouldn't, let's be honest, you know, if you're 13 years old, deciding what you want to be when you grow up, and you see that people are getting paid ridiculous amounts of money to sit online and chat with their friends and play games, which is what you do in your spare time for free, of course, that's going to be what you want to do. And so I think it's good that um, the traditional media, that books, comic books, are exploring this and are exploring both sides of it. Because, you know, you see a lot of teachers uh, and, and parents kind of saying, OK, but realistically, what do you want to do? You know, what happens if you can't become a streamer? Not everybody makes millions, which is true, which is true. And so it is good to see media looking at the, the downside to having an online life. Um, but it is also nice to see the, the, the upsides to the realities as well, that, yeah, you may not make millions, because let's be honest, the platforms are becoming oversaturated now. It is very difficult to get the kinds of numbers that the first generations of YouTubers, when they were literally the only people out there to watch, are still getting. But there are positives to it, just like there are positives to any job. And so it has been quite nice. There are only a couple of issues of Radiant Pink out. It's a, a mini series, I believe. So it's going to be five issues altogether. Um, and so if you do like the sound of that please do consider picking it up um it's a very very interesting series um i read high performance by jake humphrey and damien hughes um that is a non-fiction self-help book which is all about what it means to be a high performing person as you know because i've i mentioned it quite frequently on the show i have started my doctorate in education um, a few weeks ago, and I'm looking at performance. I'm looking at self-efficacy. I'm looking at, at how we can encourage our learners to become "quote unquote" high performers without creating kind of some kind of hothouse, pressurized environment. And what I liked about high performance was its accessible nature. It's very well written. Um, Jake, of course, is a TV presenter. He's a sports presenter. And so he knows how to phrase things in an accessible way. Um, but what I found interesting about it was it was focused on sports, which, again, you know, Jake's a sports presenter. So you would assume that. But that made me think about what we consider to be high performance, what we think about when we think of high performing people. And we do tend to think of sports people. You know, when you ask about um, who is your your role model as a high performer, who is your role model as a successful person, then we do tend to hear sports people being the ones who are lauded. That's not covered in the book. It, the, the book uses sports to um, uh, kind of a success stories, I suppose. But I am quite interested in why we look to sports for high performance as opposed to any other industry, kind of what that means for us as a society and what other industries we could look at for non-sporty people to begin to emulate. Although having said that, as somebody who is not particularly sporty, I did still enjoy the book because it is still nice to read success stories of people, to see where they've come from, to see what their backgrounds were like, and, and to kind of realise that regardless of your discipline, um, you can still use the same techniques to keep yourself focused and to keep yourself performing well. Uh, last weekend, I read Call Me By Your Name by Andre Asiman. Um, haven't seen the film. The film was all over uh, Netflix a few years ago, but I, it kind of never piqued my interest. Um, but the book was recommended to me via the library. And so I read that one and it, it was good. It was interesting. It was well written. It was very emotive. It was very evocative. Um, in case you don't know, it's about a young Italian family 
who welcome strangers from all around the world into their home every summer. The, the father is a, uh, a university lecturer, and he lets people come and essentially use their house as a writer's retreat every summer. And this one summer, his son falls in love with the young scholar who comes and stays with them for that summer. And it's just about how the feelings are not reciprocated, except that they are because nobody will talk to each other. And then it's about how the two young men um, blossom in their romance before they part ways. And it is beautifully written. Um, It kind of portrays really well that idea of, you know, first love and the intensity of those feelings. I did find it quite hard to place the time frame of the book. It it purported to be um, set in the 80s. There were very few 80s aesthetics in there. Um, It read to me more like it was in the the 40s or the 50s. I kind of read it as as quite an old book. Um, But I enjoyed it nonetheless. That was a good one. And then my latest book, I read this in one sitting yesterday, was The Last Firefox by Lee Newbery, which I enjoyed well enough for a children's book. I think I'm at the point right now where I need to accept that children's children's books are no longer for me. For a long time as a teacher, I enjoyed them, particularly when I was in primary. Um, I had a lot of fun reading children's books and exploring them and finding new things to read with my classes. Um, But I think as I was reading The Last Firefox yesterday, it occurred to me that it was a book I would have loved as a child. And probably even as a a newly qualified teacher with my first primary classes, I would have loved reading that with them and exploring lots of the themes. Uh, But just in terms of reading for my own enjoyment, it wasn't really for me. It was a great story. Um, It's an urban fantasy about, as the title suggests, the last Firefox. So the idea is that there are these creatures from another dimension called Firefoxes. um, And and the last one of them comes through a portal into our dimension because it's being chased by a hunting beast, uh, which is trying to eat it. Um, And this young boy is kind of just in the wrong place at the wrong time. And so is given this fox to, to look after. In terms of its themes, it's brilliant, and I would absolutely recommend reading this with a year six class, because the boy is in year six, and it's based during his last week in primary school. And so it deals with a lot of the fears um, and stresses that he's feeling about leaving primary school and going into year seven. Um, He also has two dads, so it's good for talking about LGBTQ parenting and for that kind of the inclusivity that still doesn't really exist in books aimed at young readers. Um, And it's set in Wales. So for those teachers in the British Isles who are looking for something Britain set, um, it would be a good one to read with a class, I think. So yeah, those have been the ones that I feel I have most enjoyed so far this year. Um, I feel like I've had quite an eclectic collection over the course of the last two months, um, going from, you know, political fantasy to children's to non-fiction. Um, four of my books have been rereads and 22 have been first time reads, which I'm very happy about because I do tend to just read the same things over and over again. I don't know if anybody else does this, but I do tend to gravitate towards the same books in the same way that I will quite often rewatch the same TV shows. Um, I have only read in English so far, which is something that I need to rectify because, you know, again, as somebody who speaks nine languages, it is ridiculous that I have only read in my native language. So I do need to fix that um, for my own professional development, if nothing else. It is really important to um, to keep my subject knowledge going and reading is the best way to do that. Um, of my books, half of them have had some kind of LGBTQ plus representation. Uh, 20% of them have just had it present within the book. 
Uh, 30% of my books have had a main character as an LGBTQ person. 50% of course then have had no LGBTQ rep at all. Um, 20% of my books have also had some kind of disability rep and 80% have not, which is quite interesting. And of those, um, a third of them have had wheel bound, uh, wheelchair bound characters. A third have had um, mental health disability representat represented, and a third of them involved double amputees. So that's quite a good selection. It's quite a good range, in my opinion, of physical and mental disabilities represented. However, it strikes me as interesting that even across my broad range of genres and of styles uh, and of formats because I've read ebooks I've read physical books I've listened to audiobooks still only five out of my 26 books have had any kind of clear disability rep so again that's probably something that I need to consider um, whether I should be reading more books that has more representation of disability but also it's quite interesting to think about publishing right now and how publishing is clearly not pumping out books with disability rep as frequently maybe as it could. Um, I have read two books by non-binary authors. I have read 12 books written by men and nine books written by women. Um, I have read 12 books written by Americans, eight books written by Brits, um, two books written by French authors, and one book each from other nationalities around the world. I have read 15 books from people I've read from before, and 11 books from people who were new to me. And generally, I have read one, pers uh, one book per person, apart from Jill Murphy, uh, because I have been rereading the um, Worst Witch books because they were a favourite of mine when I was little, uh, and Alice Osman because I have read two by them. So that's kind of my breakdown. Uh, I'm not sure if that was interesting to anybody other than me, <laughs> um, but I quite like to think about the different books that I'm reading. And actually, I do think it is important as teachers for us to consider the books that we are reading uh, and for us to talk about them. Uh, my school actually does run a book group for teachers, which um, happens on the first Friday of every month at lunchtime. It's not the traditional book club where we all read the same book and then talk about it. We just kind of go along and chat about the books that we've been reading. And I find that a really nice way to get some new recommendations. Um, to kind of be able to articulate what I'm enjoying about the books that I'm reading uh, and to think about my colleagues and see if I can recommend anything from my own shelves for them. So I think if, uh, if you've got a strong reading culture in your school, it is good to, to foster that both for your own development as people, but also it's really good for your children to see that. So our book club actually happens in the library um, and it's at lunchtime and the kids are allowed to go and use the library at lunchtime. So anyone who is up there browsing the shelves or doing some work will hear us discussing the books that we've been reading. And we'll see the kind of enjoyment and the the delight uh, in the in the books that we are taking. Uh, I've had a couple of texts come in. Please do text in um if you have anything to say on the show if you are on the podbean app listening to me right now you can text straight into the app um if you are not if you are listening to me elsewhere if you are listening on spotify on um apple on anywhere that you can get your your podcasts or on youtube because we are available via replay on youtube these days as i found the other day uh when i was googling myself uh, because I had to find something to put on my CV, not because I make a habit of Googling myself, just to uh, just to make that clear. Um, 
um please do get in in touch um you can tweet me i am at mr d lester or one word m r d l e s t e r because as i always say the things i talk about on the show are things i'm interested in things that i'm passionate about and so this will not stop being a conversation i want to have just because the show is over but we have had like i said some things come in so Thomas texted in. I enjoyed it. Thank you very much. I am glad that you did. This is something that maybe I will do on a semi-regular basis, if nothing else, because it keeps me accountable for my reading. Um, you know, I think we're all very guilty of saying things like, oh, I don't have time to read. Again, particularly as teachers, our time is precious. Everybody's time is precious, of course. But we have so much that we need to cram into our time. And, you know, I don't have time to dot, dot, dot is is how teachers will quite often start a sentence so i think you know keeping myself um accountable to to my audience here um would be good for me and also it's nice to to get some recommendations because we have so many different people here as part of the teachers talk radio family so many people download the shows listen text in and so it's good to get recommendations from other people um tim also texted in good morning to you tim is a huge friend of the show and a very pertinent person to be texting in this morning because tim is tim has his master's degree in children's literature uh and is about to get his second master's um in writing for children he was also my very first guest here way back in the summer uh, and we talked all things children's literature over two shows um, because of my disaster of, of a first show. <laughs> um, but please do go back and listen to those if you are able to. But Tim says, um, it's interesting. He likes my analytical approach. Thank you very much. And that's something that's, that many publishers, he, um, uh, Tim wanted to make sure that that was very clear, many publishers slack on, uh, which makes quantifying representation difficult. That's very true that is very true i mean there is to play devil's devil's advocate which i do hate but there is something to be said for you know oh we have to make sure that we are selling the right book and not doing token representation uh which is um absolutely understandable publishing is a business and they need to make sure that they are putting those business needs before tokenism but at the same time Everybody needs to see themselves represented, particularly children. Particularly children. Because so many children um, struggle with their identity. They struggle with knowing who they are. And they don't know where to turn. And it is their media that they turn to to make sense of the world. And we know these days, because we talk about it all the time, that is more often than not their social media. And so they are looking to their peers or the people that they they think are their peers to help to shape their world. But it is also the shows that they are watching and the books that they are reading. And children do still read, believe it or not. Um, you know, World Book Day at my school, particularly in our prep school, was a huge success. And it was lovely to see the children talking about their favourite characters and and, you know, hearing what they are reading realizing that they are just as tuned into this world as I am and and they do need to see themselves represented and and we see that by what they are choosing to read so my school um our prep school ran a decorate your classroom door competition and one of the classroom doors was decorated as heartstopper uh now just in case you are not sure what heartstopper is it is a a same-sex male-male love story set in a British secondary school. It was a big Netflix uh, miniseries. I believe the second season has been um, has been commissioned. And so it probably is Netflix rather than the comic books that got them interested. But young people are seeing or are starting to see LGBTQ representation of people their age. And that will do a lot for the LGBTQ students that we have, because as much as people want to say, oh, you know, they're too young to know their sexuality, they're too young to know their gender identity, they do. They identify in these ways. And so it is important for them to see positive 
uplifting representations of people with whom they're identifying so that they know that they are okay, so that they know they're going to be okay, and so that they know that they can navigate the world just as well as anybody else. That's my little soapbox um, for now. I think uh, let's listen to the news. This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, a leading publisher of books, directories, educational guides and magazines specifically aimed at forward-thinking schools in the UK and beyond. Have you checked out their latest releases? Don't miss out. Visit johncatbookshop.com to explore their full range of titles and advance your own professional development today. Happy reading. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and this is Teachers Talk Radio News. The iNews website covers the issue of vaping in schools. Whilst vaping is thought to have helped many adults kick their unhealthy smoking habits, the rise in straight to vaping in young people and children rings alarm bells for many. The report focuses on concerns expressed by teachers about angsty pupils struggling with the wait for their next fix. Vapors making school toilets frightening places as they gather in groups, increases in internal truancy and worries it may lead to pupils experimenting with stronger substances. Some schools have made significant changes to toilets to include sophisticated sensors which set off an alarm when e-cigarettes are used whilst others have increased numbers of staff on duty in corridors to deter pupils from skipping lessons in order to vape. Many schools have also invited police and health specialists in to talk about vaping in a bid to educate pupils on the dangers. Many schools across the UK now ban vapes, treating them like other banned items such as drugs and knives. This is prompting suspensions and other high-level sanctions in a bid to remove them from schools. England's Chief Medical Officer, Professor Sir Chris Whitty, said last week that the number of children vaping was appalling and heavily criticised companies which produce them in flavours such as green gummy bear and watermelon bubblegum. The bright colours, shapes reminiscent of highlighter pens and the low cost of around £5 making them attractive to youngsters with pocket money to spare, which Whitty described as utterly unacceptable. The proportion of 11 to 17 year olds who say they have tried vaping rose from 14% to 16% in 2022, according to a YouGov survey, with a percentage of children who regularly vape doubling in the same time period. The article also features references to Teachers Talk Radio's Tom Rogers tweet asking how much of a problem vaping was for schools, with many replies indicating it is a serious cause for concern. Full details of the article are available online. In related news, many media outlets have been reporting on so-called school protests, which seem to be focused on toilets and the right to use them as a key issue. According to multiple stories, pupils have been encouraged to protest about rules focused on restricting free access to toilets by posts on social media platforms such as TikTok. The majority of the schools affected make it clear that rules around access to toilets are made for safeguarding purposes, designed to protect all pupils and to minimise bullying, vaping and other antisocial behaviours. The Evening Standard reports that a quarter of UK student gamblers may be experiencing harm whilst half said betting had affected their university experience. The survey of over 2,000 students at UK universities was conducted in December. It found that 71% of the respondents had gambled in the last 12 months, with 24% exhibiting problem gambling behaviour. Of the students who said gambling had had an impact on their experiences at university, 13% said they'd had trouble paying for food, 10% had missed lectures and 9% struggled to pay bills. A third of student gamblers said they spent between £11 to £20 per week with 13% admitting to a spend of between £50 and £100 per week. Only 55% of those surveyed were aware that support for them was available through their universities. Full details of the report are due at the end of February. Finally, Aberdeen Live reports on a project led by the University of Aberdeen, which has led to a successful trial of a new approach to teaching which is helping improve adult literacy in Rwanda. 
the project adapted the existing adult educational curriculum to better develop relevant knowledge and skills which can be applied in students' daily lives. These techniques included role play, group activities, case studies and problem solving. Previously, only 14% of those pursuing an adult learning course felt they had gained the skills they needed, with 66% still unable to read and 76% unable to write by the end of the course. The new method showed improvements in multiple areas, with adults retaining their knowledge and skills, which were linked to nutrition and hygiene, improved household income, animal husbandry and becoming community leaders. The project was funded by the Scottish Government. This has been your Teachers Talk Radio News with Joe Fox. So the vaping in schools has been a big thing uh, in the news, in teacher social media. It's been everywhere lately. And it was actually the response to that which prompted my, my key question for today. Because we have bad PR in teaching, let's be honest. We really do. Um, you know, we have seen the parental complaints about the strike action that has been going on. Um, in the same vein, we have seen the support of the children's strikes over toilets being locked as a response to the vaping that is happening in them. Uh, we have seen complaints about teachers' dress, we have seen complaints about teachers' response to children's behaviour. Um, in, in fact, just this morning, I read about a Canadian teacher who has been suspended because of her gender representation. There are all sorts of, of negatives everywhere about teaching. And then we saw earlier this week that there are fewer people um, than ever before going into teacher training. Um, we were concerned this time last year when we saw numbers of people enrolling in ITT programs drop and those numbers have dropped again this year. And let's be honest, it's not surprising. Why would anybody, even with a cursory knowledge of how teaching is presented, both in mainstream media and on social media, wants to go into this job when all we see are the negatives, when all we hear is about how teachers are lazy and selfish because they want more money and how we never let children express themselves and how classes are out of control and how the exam system is broken and all that. Why would anybody want to go into this job? Because as we said um, before the news, as we were talking about, um, about representation, representation is important. And people will make judgments, rightly or wrongly, based on what they read, particularly if it's something they don't know about. So, you know, anybody who is wanting to go into teaching, thinking of going into teaching, but maybe they don't know anybody other than their own teachers, they're going to look at what's in the media, they're going to look at what's in the news, um, and they're going to go, mm, yeah, no, that's that's not for me, thank you very much. And, and you can't blame them. Now, I'm not saying that we need to sweep all this under the rug. I'm not saying that we need to gaslight ourselves and the wider world into thinking that everything is rosy in education, because it's not. And, you know, I don't believe in toxic positivity any more than I believe in toxic negativity. But the fact is that there are good things about our job. And quite often those good things get swept under the rug. Those those good things get not ignored necessarily, but they get lost in the the day-to-day -day negativity that we seem to find ourselves surrounded by. Um, and in fact, one of my respondents, so earlier this week, I asked um, on my social media, I asked in the Teachers Talk Radio Slack, and I sent a mass email out to all of my colleagues and to my colleagues. I apologise. I know how we all feel about mass emails, and I'm very, very sorry. Um, 
But one of my respondents put it beautifully um, when she said, thank you for making me think about the positive aspects of my role, as it's so easy nowadays to focus on the negativity, challenges, curriculum, exams, Department of Education and so on. I have to say that problem sol- constant problem solving and having to keep up with the latest education, research, reforms, etc. also keep me on my toes. And so my day just flies by. And I think that was really important. I think that's really important because I think, you know, again, I'm not here to gaslight people. I'm not here to to ignore the fact that there are problems. There are fundamental problems in our profession just as there are in all professions okay no job is going to be completely what somebody wants but i do think it's good occasionally to make a space where we can focus on the positives of what we do and so that was the point um perhaps i i I phrased it maybe in quite a negative way when i asked why bother teaching but that is honestly how i feel sometimes when i read the negativity um when i hear the complaints you just think well you know why am i putting my effort into this we all we all have multiple degrees we all have at least one degree and a postgrad certificate we all have very specific skills um those of us who are in secondary we have very specific um subject degrees at least one that we use for our teaching. Those of us in primary have a, either a subject degree or an education degree, a B.Ed., uh, which is what I did. And, And so, you know, we've all got these skills that can be used elsewhere, probably for more money, let's be honest, and for more flexibility. Because again, I was thinking, and in fact, this is probably a good time for me to read you the story from my friend Manuela. Manuela is a Spanish teacher. Um, uh, She and I have been teaching for the same length of time. And she says, um, uh, in response to my question, why bother teaching? She says, for me, it was the holidays, as I would have found it even more difficult to bring up two girls on my own with no childcare or no family around. Um, I think I even said that in an interview for my teacher placement, which I got, by the way. And again, honestly, for a lot of people, it was the holidays that is a big draw into teaching. You know, as much as that is often levied against us, uh, and we've seen that banded around a lot in the conversation about, about strikes, you know, why should you get more money when you have got all of these holidays? It is a draw, you know, knowing that every seven or so weeks you're going to get a week off, it does make it easier to get through that push of those seven weeks. It really does. Because when you're finding it difficult, when you are exhausted, as I've noticed, I don't know if this is true of all schools, so I'd be interested to see how other people feel. But I have noticed in my school, people seem to already be feeling... um, like end of term tired and we've only been back a week we went back on monday uh but you know being able to to focus on that week being able to know that in five weeks time we've got in fact this time it's three weeks off for easter that helps a lot that does help a lot now it's not all it seems and again you know i'm I'm not about the toxic positivity i'm not about the gaslighting so i will say that one year i added up Um, how much I worked. I kept track of my actual physical working hours. And I found that even um, accounting for the holidays, if you averaged it out versus what I would have worked in the nine to five job, I was still owed time at the end of the year. So even including my weeks where I was in inverted commas on holiday, I was still being owed time for what I had worked. So in for me in that year, my holidays didn't exist. I was just reclaiming time. And even then I couldn't reclaim as much time as um, as I was owed, quite frankly. But the long holidays 
particularly when you are doing it to fit around your own children, they are less of a draw these days because teaching is now one of the few professional jobs that does not offer flexible working and working from home. So where even five years ago, you know, let's be honest, pre-COVID, a big draw for many people going into teaching, particularly those who were doing a career change or those who are were going to be teaching assistants, a big draw was, oh, well, you know, I get the same holidays as my children, which means I'm going to share, save on childcare expenses when I go in. That's not a factor anymore because you could say, oh, well, I could get this office job that lets me work from home. And so I will just be there all the time. Yes, I might not be on holiday at the same time as my children, but I will be at home. So I'm going to save on childcare costs. You know, I don't have to worry about wraparound care because I will be there when my children go off to school at 8.30 in the morning. I will be there. Yes, I'll be working, but I will be in the house when my children get home at 3.30. And so I'm going to save a lot of money on childcare. So I think, you know, I, for one, remain grateful for our holidays. Um, I don't think, honestly, I could do this job without them. Um... But I don't think it's that draw anymore. Not like it used to be. Not like it used to be. Uh, Manuela went on to say, um, it took a lot of training and effort to become a qualified teacher. Uh, and that is not down to just having the holidays, but also the rewards and the gratitude that the job can also give back. I may only make a small difference to someone um be that a pupil or a colleague and that is also rewarding uh manuela i am just going to say in case you listen to this at any point you make a huge difference um both to your pupils and to your colleagues um i can say that with with confidence um in addition i love my subject and still enjoy teaching it and i still enjoy learning it too I am passionate about language learning uh, and teaching. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, Manuela. I am passionate about language learning and teaching and how teens learn, etc. So it also brings me to the fact that no two pupils are alike. No two days are the same in this job. And then there is the pastoral side. With so many teen mental health issues going on, the classroom aims have somewhat changed or have significantly taken um, priority over other class issues. And all of that is very true. Manuela was not the only one. Um, I had a maths teacher respond to me and he also said, I'm a teacher because I wanted to stay with my subject. He is one of the most passionate mathematicians that I have ever met. And he, in a follow up conversation that I had with him, it became clear that he wants to share his passion for maths with other people, but also that he wants to stay in a mathematical environment. And that got me thinking, um, and it's kind of how um, how Manuela put it, is, is, is really nice. It's nice to be within language for me all of the time. It's the only job that I could do where I am surrounded purely by language and culture all of the time. One of the things that, that MFL teachers tell their students is that languages are a transferable skill. Very few people learn a language for the sake of learning a language. Um, I mean, I do. <laughs> but I think by now we know that I'm quite an unusual case. Uh, you quite often learn a language in order to do something with it. And that's something that we try and make our, our students aware of. You know, don't come and do A-level French just to learn French. Although if you want to, great. Come and do A-level French because you know that's going to help you in business. You know that's going to help you as a doctor. You know that's going to help you as an artist, whatever it might be. And so, you know, obviously I could take my language skills and do all kinds of jobs. Um, honestly, probably for more money but they wouldn't allow me to be as ingrained in language as I am. I get to be surrounded by language all the time. I get to learn new words. A, a child will say to me, oh, Mr. Lester, how do you say such and such in Chinese? And I realise I don't know, so I look it up and I get to learn with them. And, and I get to share that experience of learning. 
and and for me that's really important you know to be able to be surrounded by my subject um peter has texted in listening all the way from ghana nice to have you here peter i hope that you enjoy the show so thank you manuela uh thank you for your reply i am glad that um you were able to think about the positives in your role i'm glad that that i gave you the opportunity to do that and i'm glad that you were able to find them um because that is really really important so while i'm thinking of it the the maths teacher who enjoys being within his subject he also said he enjoys helping people and that's really important because that is essentially what we do if you listened to my show last week uh construction can cognitivism is what i'm trying to say cognitivism 101 part two you'll have heard me talk about how knowledge is constructed and for me as a social constructivist knowledge is constructed socially so it's constructed by working with other people and so as a teacher if you enjoy helping people then you are going to enjoy teaching because you enjoy that creation of that knowledge um he says i enjoy being around other people who enjoy helping people and i think that's really interesting i think that says a lot about his colleagues um so clearly that school is a very positive one for him to work in and I also think that it says a lot about the type of people who go into teaching. It is, <clears throat> after all, a, a pastoral profession. It is about helping. And we come as teachers from all walks of life. I don't think I've ever met any two teachers who have the same experience or who have the same reason for going into teaching, which is one of the reasons that I asked the question. Uh, was to show people who might be thinking of going into teaching that you can come from pretty much any walk of life and still find something rewarding in the job. But we all clearly have this innate desire to help. And maybe that's what it boils down to. Maybe that is the answer to my question. Why bother teaching? Because you want to help. Uh, he says, I enjoy being good at it at least in some cases we like that <laughs> that modesty um but again you know if if you are good as a teacher you quite often know it because kids will tell you <laughs> if you are not a good teacher and of course you must always take feedback from students with a grain of salt um because it's not cool for kids to like their teachers they will never admit but it, no, that's not true. When they get to kind of years 11, 12, 13, they will admit that they like their teachers. And when they are younger, primary school kids will quite often tell you if they like you. But in those middle years, kind of years 7 to 10, 7 to 11, it's not cool to admit that they like you. So the feedback that you get from the kids must always be taken with a grain of salt. And on the other side of that, if you have students who are flatterers by nature and think that they can get you on side by talking about how wonderful you are you need to be careful of that um but you do quite often know very quickly whether teaching is a job that is right for you that you are cut out for and so there isn't a perpetual sense of self-doubt over the job you know whether you should be there or not and he says, I enjoy developing curricula. So developing a curriculum is something very different to being in the classroom. Making resources, planning lessons is very different to teaching them. They are two very different full time jobs. Um, and I think it's it's that that keeps it varied, kind of like Manuela said about how no two days are the same. This is because we've got so many different things that we need to do. There are so many different parts to our job. Um, and so if you can find, you, you're not going to enjoy all of them. You're not. That is just the, the truth of it. You will enjoy some parts of it more than others. But if you can find a few that you enjoy, and you can really focus on those, then that will make it worth doing. 
very, very interesting point came in to me from a swimming teacher. Uh, and I loved this one because it's something that I hadn't thought about before. Um, but she says, uh, mine's an easy one. I teach swimming. The skills taught and acquired in my lesson can keep a child safe in water, allow them the freedom to enjoy swimming with friends, pool parties, surfing, jet skiing, open water swimming, canoeing, um, walking along the canal, the lakes, the ponds, the list goes on. In year seven, the children are taught life-saving and having the foundation to be able to swim already, the pupils learn how to help others and this could one day save the life of someone else. It's invaluable and I love my job. And and that one really, really stuck with me. Um, because swimming teachers do literally teach skills that will save somebody's life by I suppose by trying to put the children in a position where they won't be endangered you know the life the life-saving skills are very important because that will allow somebody to save somebody else who is in trouble but also the 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 ability to swim will mean that these children themselves won't necessarily get into that trouble and I think that's really important. And I think sometimes, again, we get so caught up in the academia of our job, which is very important. It is very important uh, that we forget about the real world applications that we have. A former colleague of mine, French teacher, um, she used to tell the story of the time she saved somebody's life um just by being able to speak french um th she was in a hotel uh, i forget the details of the story but broadly she was in a hotel um there were some other english people along along her corridor um and at one point one of the uh one of the other guests in the hotel got into trouble and, and had to phone an ambulance but didn't speak french and the operator on the other side of the call didn't speak English. And so it was only through um, my former colleague's interception by, by taking the phone and being able to explain what was wrong to get the ambulance to the hotel, then to meet the paramedics at the hotel, take them up to the room and act as interpreter between paramedic and patient, um, that that person was able to get the treatment that they needed. And again, you know, it, you don't think of language skills as being as life-saving as swimming. Uh, and I'm not saying, of course, that being able to speak a language is always going to save somebody's life in the same way that swimming does and uh, can and does. But in that case, it did. And we don't know what would have happened to that poor woman um, who needed the ambulance had my colleague, fluent in both English and French, not been there to intervene. And there is quite often those real world skills that we need to focus on, because another criticism that is often levied at school is, and it usually is maths related, it's always going to be something like, oh, you know, I've never had to use Pythagoras in my life. And no, no, maybe you haven't this is true. But somebody has. I would imagine somebody who is sitting in maths with you has had to use Pythagoras. And in a school system where we have classes of 35 children, not everything is going to be relevant to everybody. But everything will be relevant to somebody. And that's what we have to keep focused on. So I liked that. I liked that very much. And thank you to that teacher uh, for sharing that story, because that was a, 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 an angle that I hadn't really thought about. Um, Claire Easter is an ICT, a computing teacher, who emailed me to say, I dropped out of a PhD to go into teaching. 
So that's that's a commitment right there. You know, the, the doctorate itself is a commitment. And to then make that change, that shows that something must have sparked. Um, Claire goes on to say, I enjoyed the tutorial session that I ran and realized that I needed human contact as a reason to do a job. It's the reason that I stay in it rather than go to use my spreadsheet skills in a job that involves fewer requests for other people to sit down. <laughs> I wonder if teachers find that anybody who transitions out of teaching into another job, whether they find themselves trying to regulate the behavior of their colleagues just as a, a, a reflex. Um, but it was that that I needed human contact that uh, that really stood out to me, because, again, like I said about 20 minutes ago, if you want the flexibility of like the holidays and stuff because it makes childcare come easier, then a work from home job these days is more logical than teaching. But of course, working from home doesn't suit people who need the hustle and bustle of being around other people. Now, as quite an introverted person, I quite liked working from home as a teacher um, because I did have contact with with my students during lockdown. I, all of my lessons were taught live, um, but I did find that I didn't mind doing it from home. Um, and in many ways, actually, as an introverted person, I felt less drained at the end of the day um, because I was able to to have that space. I, I didn't have that energy kind of coming at me all the time. But again, I acknowledge that other people do need that. And, and that is a good reason to go into teaching because, you know, you walk into a class of 30 other people and there is an energy there. And if you can, if you can be motivated by that, if you feed off that for want of a better term, um, I think that's really positive. Um, I do reply to Claire's email um, and point out that I've just started my ed D, and so that is something that she might want to think about um, if the if the doctor is still something that she would like to achieve. But um, yeah, that was an interesting one. That need for human contact, because so many jobs can be very isolating. Um, and so many jobs can, so many jobs can only have negative human contact, I think. You know, if you work in customer services, I am sure that the vast majority of your day is spent fielding complaints from people. I would imagine very few people get in touch with customer services to say, thank you, I've had a great time shopping today, um, keep doing what you're doing. And, you know, yes, sometimes we do get negative um, responses from our children. You know, the you, again, you've got 30 people in one room. Chances are at least one of them is going to be having a bad day. But you also do get the positivity from them, uh, which is really, really important. So I liked that. Thank you, Claire, for sharing that with me. Um, Sean Dunn is Deputy Head Academic at Wycliffe College here in Gloucestershire. Um, and he sent me a very interesting story um, that I'm going to, I'm just going to read in full because uh, Sean always has very interesting things to say. He says, uh, teaching is my third career or fifth, depending on how you measure things. Uh, which perhaps reinforces Shaw's infamous quote. Um, it has, however, been the most rewarding. After enduring factory work, never again, I'd had one career ended by injury and was then experiencing another in the ostensibly more glamorous area, uh, arena of broadcast journalism. Uh, the reality, of course, was very different. Not that I went into journalism for the glamour. Um, it was pure naivety and working 16 hour shifts for a rate that literally did not pay the mortgage was demoralizing. Dealing with the egos of many, uh, the battlefield created by the cutthroat ambition of others and negotiating the truths and half truths of uh, contributors reduced the appeal even further. Kind of putting me off my Teach Talk radio show, Sean, I'm just, just saying that right now. Um, to supplement the, the, the meager salary uh, that he was being paid, Sean took on some PR work, 
but uh, found I was selling my soul to the devil. As I defended one client in public whose shortcomings had led to the death of a 10-year-old child, I knew that I needed a change. And I think I'm just going to pause in Sean's story there because I think that's really important. Because sometimes we can get so bogged down in the negativity of our own job that we forget that all jobs come with negative aspects. And some of them are really quite harrowing. I I quite often think, you know, I could never be a doctor, a, a medical doctor, because I wouldn't want that life or death responsibility. I couldn't handle that. I couldn't handle knowing that I was responsible for um, somebody recovering from illness. I couldn't handle the idea that maybe I'd miss something and, and somebody might have got worse as a result of me. I know that in teaching, if there is something that I don't know and a child asks, I can go and look it up and I can tell that child the next time that I see them. I have no issue with telling children I don't know something. Um, I personally think it's really important for children to see me consulting a dictionary or going onto Google to find out a statistic uh, for A-level because I think it's important for them to know that even teachers who are seen as you know the gatekeepers of knowledge don't know everything. And so if I don't know everything, it's okay that they don't know everything too. I think that's really important. But of course... As a doctor, not knowing something could could be the difference between life and death. And, and I really know that I couldn't handle that. So my hat's off to, to all the doctors out there, to the lawyers, the solicitors, who need to defend, as Sean said, defend people who they know have done wrong, but it's their job to defend them anyway. My mum and I were talking about this quite recently, Um, because my memory likes true crime. And she said that she would find it really difficult um, to be uh, a lawyer and defend somebody that she knew was guilty of murder. So, yeah, that's something that I couldn't do. Uh, Sean goes on to say, "Um, I had some workplace training experience and I'd find I really enjoyed supporting the development of others. Uh, My wife was teaching and I saw how enriching her job was, even though it was clearly exhausting. I found a job in a sixth form college where I could take my PGC whilst working, something that was quite rare then, and off I went. I immediately felt at home. Working with teenagers is of course challenging, but the rewards are immense. What a privilege we have in helping these young people find their place in the world, supporting them through the awful adolescent stages, and providing the foundations for all that will follow. When I interview prospective teachers for where I work now, alongside some teaching know-how, I want to see in applicants the grasp of the facet as well as a passion, uh, sorry, a grasp of that facet as well as a passion for their subject. Teaching is a human-to-human role. As such, it is bound to include some fraught moments. Nothing worth doing is easy. But why bother teaching? Because despite all the nonsense around it, at its heart, is that interpersonal opportunity to make a tangible difference. And again, that reiterates what Claire had said. That reiterates the swimming teacher. That reiterates the maths teacher. It reiterates Manuela. It's all about this human-to-human contact. That seems to be the thread that runs through so many of the stories that, uh, that I've got to tell you this morning. Of course... Uh, Sean goes on to conclude, the students are not sitting waiting for the words of wisdom to drip from my lips. It's not goodbye, Mr. Chips. It's not freedom writers. It's not dead poet society. Which is a shame, (laughs) in my opinion, because I love those films. Um, There are the boring bits that have to be done. There is the necessary bureaucracy. There are the challenging students, the demanding stakeholders, the late night preparation and marking. Uh, but I've done other things, and this beats them all. So thank you, Sean, uh, for sending me your story, for putting it so eloquently so that I didn't need to change anything, uh, that I could just read the email that you sent me. And for summing it up so fantastically, um, because I think all of that in there is very true. 
a head teacher that I spoke to um, midweek said that it was just something she felt she was born to do. She knew that she'd wanted to be a teacher ever since she was little. Um, she then trained in the TEFL uh, and she did a full on the actual Kelta Delta courses. Um, because, of course, as we know, TEFL has been an area which was unregulated for a very long time. Um, and there was always the kind of stigma around TEFL teachers because it was something that people for a long time just did on their gap year. If you could speak English as a native, then you were almost guaranteed to get a TEFL job, which was always very difficult for those of us because I have, uh, I trained TEFL as well. I have a TEFL certificate. Um, and, and so it was always quite demoralizing for those of us that went and got the, and, and did the training um, to see other people who hadn't done that training just walk in and, and, and take the same jobs that we were doing. Um, but yeah, this, this head said that the, the first day of her TEFL course, they put her in front of a class and, and she knew that she had been right. It was being with the students. It was being with the kids that really, really drove home to her the fact that she was where she was meant to be. I spoke to another teacher who had made a career change. It was quite interesting to me how many teachers uh, have gone into teaching as a career change option. Um, this teacher that I spoke to had been working as an engineer uh, for BT for his whole working life. He'd left school early, so he had no O levels, no A levels. Uh, he'd gone straight into engineering. Um, so he had engineering certificates, engineering diplomas. Um, he'd been teaching Sunday school on the side whilst being an engineer and enjoyed that, um, but never kind of occurred to him to go into teaching as his actual profession. Um, and then he, he, he was being offered redundancy. Um, the, the company at the time was making layoffs and they had offered redundancy he had two young children there was a third on the way so redundancy didn't seem like it was an option for him but he found that he was becoming increasingly miserable in his job um and so one day on the last day in fact that the redundancy package was um was on offer his wife sat down with him and said look you should probably take it and find a job that will bring you more joy that you are more passionate about. And so he did. He took the redundancy and with two young children and another on the way, he got the qualifications that he needed. He did his teacher training uh, and he has been teaching ever since. He's worked his way up. He's now a head of department. Uh, he is in fact approaching retirement. Um, and I told him that he's not allowed to talk about that because he will be a big loss to his school. But he said that it was the best decision that he ever made, taking that redundancy package. It was it was terrifying at the time, um, because, of course, a career change always is. But a career change when you have got a family on the way is probably or, or when you are enlarging your family is probably the worst, uh, scariest thing that you can think of. But he said it was the best thing because he, he said, and he put it beautifully, he said, I feel like I'm giving something back. Every time we communicate with the children, every time we teach them something, albeit within our subject or in real life, or just through being compassionate, being human with them, we are giving something back to a world that, let's be honest, as teachers, we have been able to profit from, you know, because we have had access to higher education to get the qualifications that we need to teach. We had the privilege of being able to go to university, you know, of being able to take out loans to fund our studies or of having the time and the energy to work through our studies in order to fund them, whatever it might have been. 
we have had those privileges and it is nice to to be able to feel like you are giving somebody back by by privileging somebody else by giving somebody else your knowledge your expertise so that they can lead a better life so once again it's that human connection isn't it it it's that feeling like you're making a difference it's not all about making a difference of course we have to be aware that teaching is a job and we work so that we can afford to live and the pay in teaching is something that comes under a lot of scrutiny it's talked about a lot it's the reason that people are striking right now paying conditions is the official reason that people are going on strike but interestingly one of the stories that i was told the first story in fact that i collected this week from a german teacher made me realize that pay actually isn't so bad particularly at the beginning of your career so this teacher um had worked for a travel company she organized um guided tours uh she knew that she liked working with the public she liked doing the tours she liked being with the people so again it's that human connection uh she didn't like the office stuff hated the office stuff found it incredibly dull but did like the 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 being with other people um and she found herself a bit restless she found herself wanting to do something else and looking at teaching <clears throat> excuse me and she found that in her early 20s the pay that she would that she was being offered as an NQT or that she would have been offered as an NQT was higher than the salary that she was earning at her travel company. And so of course that's a no brainer, particularly when you're in your early twenties and you are kind of just starting out, the more money you can earn, the better. So she made the transition. And lots of people do that. You know, why do we think people are being offered bursaries to train to teach? It's because money is an incentive. I know lots of people, actually, no, it's not fair to say lots. I know some people who trained to teach in order to get the bursary, but then did not go into teaching. And and they took the bursary because that was higher than anything that they would have earned in that same year in a regular job. but you know when you get to and 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 this teacher actually said when you get to your 30s which kind of reflecting on it is is more true than i would like to admit that's when the pay stops being the same as or more than your other professional peers that that's when we start to get overtaken because our job doesn't have a a non-management pay progression structure so when you go through threshold you are then at the top of your pay scale and unless you want to take on tlr teaching and learning responsibility so unless you want to go into some kind of management there is no pay progress then other than annual pay rises which of course as we know teachers have not had really uh, of late and that is an issue within our profession. As somebody who has no interest in going into management, I actually have personally not only no pay progression, but no career progression. I'm having to make my own. It's one of the reasons that I do the show, honestly. It's one of the reasons that I write textbooks. It's one of the reasons that I like to host at the uh, MFL Teach Meet, which is happening today. Uh, just in case you didn't know. In fact, it's probably happening right now. I'm looking forward to um, to catching up with some of the talks after my show today. Uh, so, you know, we can create our own career progression, but that isn't ingrained in our in our job. And so for somebody like me who enjoys that human connection, who enjoys being with the kids and, and doesn't want to have to come out of the classroom in order to, you know, be a middle leader be a senior leader whatever it might be 
there is no progression. And so if you're an ambitious person, if you're the type of person that teaching really needs because you can show children how to work hard, but you don't want to go into management because you like being in the classroom, you're going to find a different job. You're going to find a job that allows you to progress whilst actually doing your job. <laughs> Instead of progressing by doing something that is not actually related to the thing you like. And so that does have to change, particularly if we are going to retain teachers. Now, teacher retention is a whole separate kettle of fish. It's a whole other show on its own. Um, again, the maths teacher that I spoke to earlier, he and I had a back and forth midweek about this. Because retention is its own thing. But there is a reason why five years seems to be the cap right now, why people tend to teach for five years and then move out into something different. And that reason is the pay. That reason is because at five years, we stop being paid in line with our contemporaries. And so if you need that money, which we all do, when you live in capitalism, money is a requirement and you have transferable skills, because we all have them, of course you're going to move over if that human connection isn't enough. And we see that with TAs. We've seen that with the mass exodus of TAs from primary schools lately, because they can earn more money working in supermarkets than being in school. And, and every single one that I have seen on social media that I've spoken to in person, every TA who has left in order to get a job somewhere else has said, I hate that I have to leave the kids. I hate that I don't get to see my colleagues, but I can do, I can earn more money for doing fewer hours, which also fit around my children. And ultimately that is kind of what it comes down to isn't it? It's, it's how the work is going to balance with your life and balance with what you need, balance with what your goals are. One last story for you. Um, and I can't say too much about this one um, because the teacher that I spoke to wasn't allowed to say too much about it. But essentially another career change teacher who is not allowed to talk about her previous career, um, found that she was very bored in her previous career. It, it, was, it was very much an office job setting, and she found herself clock watching. And she doesn't like to be bored. She likes to move around. Um, she likes to bounce from project to project, idea to idea. Um, and, and, and so she said that the reason that she left her last job is because of the clock watching, because of the boredom, uh, because she felt she was just doing the same day over and over again. But in teaching, she doesn't feel like that. She doesn't think she has ever watched the clock. Uh, she graduated, I believe, in 2016 and doesn't believe that she has watched the clock once in, in all of those years. There is always something different. There is always something to move on to. There is always something to do. Quite often, there is always too much to do. And you would love to be able to clock watch. I think that sometimes when I'm sitting there with my pile of marking um, after school, I think it would be nice if this were an office job where I could, you know, spend the day with my Twitter page open and just refreshing and scrolling and occasionally entering some numbers into a spreadsheet. I'm not saying that that's what office jobs are, of course. I understand. All jobs have their their benefits. All jobs have their difficulties. Um, but she said, as somebody who doesn't like to be bored, and as somebody who is bored easily, um, she finds that teaching suits her quite nicely because there is always something to do because you are always moving. In her setting, lessons are 30 to 35 minutes long. So, you know, you, you get your class in, you get them to do something, the bell goes, they go off, a new class comes in. And so for somebody like her, who does enjoy that moving from um, 
from activity to activity, teaching is probably perfect, honestly, because it does mean that she gets built into her day all of that, that stimulation that she needs. This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, a leading publisher of books, directories, educational guides and magazines specifically aimed at forward-thinking schools in the UK and beyond. Have you checked out their latest releases? Don't miss out. Visit johncatbookshop.com to explore their full range of titles and advance your own professional development today. Happy reading. So, why bother teaching? That's um, that's the question that I've asked today. I have loved hearing everybody's stories. Thank you to everybody who got in touch with me to share their story. Uh, and I'm sorry that if you were in touch with me and I didn't have time to share your story today. Um, I think what it comes down to, the thing that all of these stories have in common is that making a difference, wanting to make a difference, wanting to have that human connection. We need to not be naive about it. Like Sean said, you know, it's not Dead Poet Society. It's not Goodbye Mr. Chips. You're not going to have queues of children lined up outside of your classroom, teary-eyed to thank you for changing their lives. That's fiction. But we do make a difference. Not to everybody. We won't all make a difference to every child that we teach. But every child that we teach does have a difference made to them by a teacher. In fact, another story that I was told um, said that she went into teaching because of the government advert that was like, everybody remembers a good teacher. And, and she wanted to be that teacher that somebody remembered. And it's okay that it's not all of your pupils. Because even if it's just one, even if in a 30 year career, it's one child that you've really impacted, be that through your subject or through your relationship with them, or because they were going through a tough time and you listened when they needed somebody to listen, that is what makes it worth doing. We are not going to be paid the same as we could make in other professional jobs. That's just, unfortunately, the nature of it. Because we are funded by the government, and we all know that government spending is stretched to its limit as it is, it will never be for the money. Although the money isn't bad, let's be honest. Compared to other graduate jobs, yes, but just in terms of, of earning a living, it, it's okay. It won't be for the flexibility, because the flexibility is no longer as good as it is in other jobs. Could be for the holidays, could be by all means for the holidays, although, as I've said, um, I dread to think how much time I'm still owed <laughs> over the course of my career, and I've only been in it 16 years. But if you want to make a difference, even if it is just to one person, and that's enough, then that's why you should bother. And and to anybody out there who is thinking about going into teaching and isn't sure, do go into a school. Do See if you can volunteer, see if you can do some work experience, see if you can do something to engage with the young people and see if it's for you. Because if it is, then as everybody who shared their story with me has said, it's the best job in the world. And that's why you should do it. That's why we bother. On that schmaltzy note, <laughs> we have come to the end of our show for today. Thank you. Thank you so much to everybody who has listened in. Thank you to everybody who has ever listened in um, to the Saturday morning breakfast. We, we get the stats. Um, popped into the Teachers Talk Radio Slack every month. And I'm always blown away by how many people listen to my show, how many people download. Uh, so thanks to all of you who have ever downloaded, who have ever interacted. I appreciate it. I am the only show today. So as I always say, please do go back through the archive. There are lots and lots of shows that you can listen to. Some fantastic, um, inspirational 
uh, teachers have their own shows here, and I do implore you to go and check those out. Um, we will, of course, Teach Talk Radio will be back tomorrow, so please do tune in then. And until next week, I hope that you have a wonderful week, and I will be speaking with you soon. Goodbye. You've been listening to Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live and listen back at ttradio.org. We look forward to hearing from you next time on Teachers Talk Radio.